What we're going to focus on in this lecture is Christology that comes out of the global south, particularly Christology that comes out of Latin America, something known as liberation Christology, which is part of a movement that started among Roman Catholics in Latin America called liberation theology. Uh, this corresponds in your textbook in Karkainen. It corresponds to chapter six, that is Christologies from the global south. So what we're looking at here is a particular kind of Hispanic or Latin Christology, Latino-Latina Christology. The origins of liberation Christology go back to liberation theology in the 1970s and the 1980s. And this is really a modern rethinking not only of classic Christian theology, but it's a modern rethinking of classic Christology. And what you're going to see here is a group of individuals from the global south who aren't arguing about the humanity of Jesus or the divinity of Jesus. And you aren't going to see individuals arguing about the Trinity and how that works. You're, you're going to see individuals who look back to the historical Jesus, who look back to his life and to his teachings, and who say something has been missed by a number of individuals throughout the history of the church when it comes to how they understand Jesus. Now, the people who start this movement, and it's still going on today, even though some people will say it's not, the people who start this movement will tell you what they're doing isn't new. They're simply bringing back something that has been forgotten for a long time in the church. So when they emphasize things like Jesus and justice or Jesus and social issues or social concerns, they would say Jesus has always done this. There, there were saints in the church like St. Francis and others who were concerned with questions of justice and issues of justice. It's just that a lot of people forgot that this was the kind of thing Jesus was talking about. And so one individual in particular that liberation theologians look back to is a Spanish Dominican named Bartolome de las Casas. In fact, some will say he was the originator of liberation Christology or liberation theology. And why they point to Las Casas is because Las Casas, as a priest, stood up against the European oppression of natives, indigenous people in the New World. Uh, in fact, there have been many who have said, instead of celebrating Columbus Day, we should celebrate Bartolome de Las Casas Day. That's particularly the case if you're in the Roman Catholic Church, because Las Casas was someone who stood up for the poor, he stood up for the indigenous, he wrote against Christopher Columbus, and he was against the colonization of the New World. In fact, he thought the rights of the indigenous were being destroyed, that the dignity of the indigenous individuals was being destroyed by Europeans, and he thought that, as Christians, European powers should not be exploiting natives in the New World. So what liberation theology does, and this is what it does with Christology as well, is it looks at history and it acknowledges that history is always written by the winners and history is essentially tainted because the history we get comes from those who are in power. And what it wants to do instead is it wants to look at the underside of history. It wants to look at the stories of the people who've lost. And in the process of doing that, it tries to restore the voices of the poor. It tries to restore the voices of the oppressed. And this is what liberation Christology is really all about. It's saying that what's happened is throughout Christian history, while people argued about, is Jesus God? Is he human? How does the Trinity work? They forgot this basic teaching of Jesus, that the life of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, are all about the poor and the oppressed. And so what we should be doing with Jesus is imitating Jesus and taking care of the poor and the oppressed.
And as you'll see, this becomes very, very controversial because a lot of the Christology that comes out of the global south is rereading Jesus in a way that's antithetical, that's against uh, how Jesus is read in many churches throughout the United States and Western Europe. The founders of liberation theology, even though they would say they really aren't the founders of liberation theology, that it goes way back in Christian history, are people like Gustavo Gutierrez. Gustavo Gutierrez now teaches at the University of Notre Dame. He's also a member of the Dominican Order, the Order of Preachers. He wrote uh, really what became the Bible of liberation theology, a book called The Theology of Liberation. And this was an extremely controversial book when it came out uh, in the 1970s, and it's gone through several different traditions. And one of the things he points out in a theology of liberation is that Jesus is a liberator, not just someone who's come to liberate us from personal guilt or personal sin, but someone who's come to liberate us from poverty, liberate us from oppressive economic structures, to liberate us from social injustices, etc. And many people that look at this book now will say, well, it's really not all that radical, but when it came out in the 1970s, it was a radical critique of what classic Christology and classic Christianity, especially in the United States and in Europe, had been saying for centuries. There's also individuals like Leonardo Boff, who wrote uh, a very important introduction to liberation theology. There's also individuals like uh, Juan Luis Segundo and John Sorbino. These are some of the big individuals that came out of Latin America who were writing about this type of Jesus and this type of Christology. This Christology that really works from the bottom up and really concentrates on who was the human Jesus and what was his human experience. And something to notice here is all of these individuals are Roman Catholic. Uh, they come out of the Catholic Church. There was a lot of back and forth, a lot of tension uh, until the election of the recent Pope, Pope Francis from Argentina, between this type of thinking about Jesus and the Roman Catholic Church in general. People were afraid of it and people are still afraid of it. If you look, were to look at the characteristics of liberation Christology and to look at how it answers Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? It has a pretty straightforward answer on this that to many people makes total complete sense. To others, it makes very, very little sense. But essentially what liberation Christology is all about is it looks at Jesus and it says the one thing that Jesus is is he is the liberator. And as I already hinted at, he isn't simply a liberator from personal guilt and personal sin. What he is is he's a liberator from sinful structures. And I'll, I'll get into this a bit more uh, in this lecture, but it's important to keep that in mind. He liberates us from sinful structures. That can include corporations, that can include governments, that can include economic systems, etc. And what liberation Christology also does is it points out that the earliest documents on Jesus, like the Gospel of Mark, focus on the suffering of Jesus. So Mark does this, and the writings of Paul, they do this. They focus on the death of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus. And instead of seeing Jesus as someone that gives you or anyone prosperity, what happens in liberation Christology is that if Jesus suffered, then his followers are going to suffer. So if Jesus is the suffering servant of God, if Jesus is the suffering son of God, the suffering Messiah who dies, then there is something holy and there is something sacred about suffering. Now, that's very, very different from what we see in a lot of Christianities, plural, in the United States and in Europe, where the emphasis is put on Jesus helping you achieve something. Liberation theology and liberation Christology says 
actually it's not the successful whom God is with. It's the suffering whom God is with. And we'll come back to this again because this also has become an important piece of modern Roman Catholic theology as well. The other thing that happens in this type of thinking is that salvation and the Christian life and Jesus himself is not about the individual, but the community is everything. So you don't experience God by by being an individual who personally is saved. You don't experience God by going off on your own individual salvation experience. Everything that happens is within the context of a community. And usually that community is an oppressed community. And what people like Gutierrez, John Sorbino, Leonardo Boff, and others are saying is to really understand Jesus and to really understand Christianity, you have to be part of a community that understands suffering. The other thing, and this is somewhat controversial, is that liberation Christology recognizes the humanity of Jesus and says, we need to be honest, not just about the suffering of Jesus, but the fact that Jesus himself was an emotional individual. In the Gospel of John, for instance, Jesus weeps when his friend Lazarus is pronounced dead. And in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and also in John, Jesus is angry, especially when he cleanses out the temple of God and overturns the tables of the money changers. So being angry, being outraged, particularly at suffering and injustice, is okay. And so a lot of liberation theologians who talk about liberation Christology say, in all these debates throughout church history about who is Jesus, is he God, is he human, how does that work, so much of this was lost in the process. So that if you went and read the Nicene Creed, you just may not get this, that Jesus is a liberator, suffering is important, outrage is okay. In 1968, Catholic bishops in Latin America released this statement, which is really a good summary of liberation theology and how it understands Jesus. So at the Medellin Conference in 1968, a group of Latin American Catholic bishops wrote this. The misery that besets large masses of human beings in all our countries is described in many studies. The misery as a collective fact expresses itself as injustice which cries to the heavens. The point that these Latin American bishops are making is that liberation Christology and liberation theology are shaped by the experiences of oppression. And Christology is shaped not by a Jesus who triumphs, but by a Jesus who first suffers. So again, if if you were thinking about which texts in the New Testament are liberation theologians looking at, they really are looking at the Gospel of Mark. They're really looking at the letters of Paul. They're really focusing on the fact that Jesus as a human being suffered and was throughout his life oppressed and told his followers that they were going to suffer and be oppressed as well. So again, if you really want to understand Jesus, what the global South says to those of us in the Western world in the North is then you have to understand oppression and you have to understand suffering. In churches today in Latin America, Christians who follow Jesus in Latin America often do two things. They reflect on the injustices around them, and then they engage in something called praxis. One of the things that liberation Christology preaches is that action is key. 
no matter what you happen to think or not think about Jesus, the most important thing is really to act on behalf of Jesus and on behalf of what he taught. And that's praxis. Praxis simply means action. So many of us here in the United States, and this would be true in Canada and in Western Europe, when we think about Jesus and when we talk about Jesus, we often reflect on Jesus. Who is he? What does he mean to me? And we've seen this throughout a lot of Christian history. All these different groups of Christians and all these different councils reflecting on who is Jesus. Liberation Christology says you can do that, but that's not enough. Even simply confessing that Jesus is the Son of God or Jesus is the second person of the Trinity is not enough. What has to happen is the next step, which is putting that reflection into action. Now, there's been a lot of examples of this, both in Latin America and, in fact, in the United States. You may not be familiar with any of these groups, but uh, these are groups of Christians in the United States or groups started by Christians in the United States who have been affected by the type of Christology found in the Global South. So, for, for instance, the Catholic Workers Movement. This was a movement started years ago by Dorothy Day and it continues down to this day. The Catholic Workers Movement is largely a movement started by American Catholics who eventually became influenced by the Christology of liberation theology. And while they sat around and talked about Jesus and read about Jesus and read books about Jesus and read all kinds of philosophical and theological works. At the end of the day, they did things like start soup kitchens, start houses for the poor in New York City and other cities. They started communal farms. What they were trying to do was directly address the injustices of modern society. Oscar Romero was an archbishop in El Salvador who was killed in the late 70s. Archbishop Oscar Romero did the same thing in El Salvador that the Catholic workers are trying to do here in the United States. Of course, it's easier to do this in the United States than in El Salvador in the 1970s. But when Oscar Romero, as a Catholic archbishop, began speaking out on behalf of the poor, when he began speaking out on behalf of the oppressed, his government killed him. But those two examples, and there's many others I could give of Dan Berrigan, the School of the Americas Watch, all sorts of things. All of these are, are examples of individuals that have been affected by the Jesus of liberation theology who say, we can't just sit around and pontificate or think about Jesus. We have to put that into some kind of action. And the action isn't just going and telling the world about you need Jesus because you're sinful or you need salvation, etc. The action is to confront oppression, to confront injustice in modern society. One of the things then that liberation theology does with Jesus is it looks at the social nature of our existence and it says if, if people believe if followers of Jesus believe that Jesus has come for all of us to save all of us, and if we're all made in the direct image of God, then we are somehow all connected as individuals. And we should uphold that connection, that idea that we are all connected. And where a lot of people are leery of this approach, is in how this type of reading of Jesus defines sin. The Jesus of liberation Christology is a Jesus who isn't so much saying you're a sinner or I'm a sinner or this person over here is a sinner. What 
the Jesus of Liberation Christology is doing is that Jesus is saying sin is not found just in individuals. It doesn't deny that. It says that all human beings are sinful individuals. But it goes further and says if human beings are sinful and human beings make up structures that are prevalent in society, then those structures are probably also sinful. So where a lot of Christianity in Europe and a lot of Christianity in the United States and in Canada has focused on the sinful individual, the Jesus of the global south is a Jesus who focuses on structures of sin. So, and this becomes very, very controversial when you start to think about it, is someone like a Gutierrez or a Leonardo Boff will say, Governments can be inherently sinful because they are made up of sinful people. They would not buy the argument, for example, that the U.S. government is a good government or that any government is a good government. Could be, but there's also the potential for that government to cause suffering and to cause oppression. Now, in the 1970s and the 1980s, when liberation theologians talked about Jesus and they talked about governments, they were often talking about the United States government. They were pointing their fingers at the U.S. government. This, of course, caused a lot of alarm because people weren't used to thinking, and many still aren't used to thinking, of the United States as being a bad guy in history or in politics or in world affairs. But the logic of liberation theology and the logic of a Jesus coming out or being reinterpreted by the global south is that it's possible for any government to be sinful and evil because it's a societal structure composed of people that are sinful and evil. It also sees sin as being found in society in general, that society can be unjust that the economic structure of a society can be unjust and sinful. It sees this in corporations, that corporations that control the lives of consumers can be sinful and unjust, and it sees it again in entire countries. The way that liberation theology does this is through social analysis. And probably the thing that got liberation theologians in so much trouble is that they use the writings of Karl Marx along with Christianity to analyze society and to talk about its sins. Now, when you're doing this in the 1970s and the 1980s, this is very problematic because you're doing it during the period of the Cold War, when the United States and the Soviet Union were constantly bickering with one another, where it wasn't clear if one was going to use nuclear weapons to annihilate the other. And Marxism, the writings of Karl Marx, and the ideology and philosophy of Karl Marx, that became synonymous with the Soviet Union. While in many respects, Christianity in one way, shape, or form, became synonymous with the United States of America. These Christians from the global south, from, particularly from Latin America, they weren't saying that Marxism is right. One of the big problems, in fact, that they had with the writings of Karl Marx is that Marx had issues with religion and that Marx had issues uh, with God in general. They didn't approve of the atheism of the Soviet Union. They didn't approve of the oppression of Christians by the Soviet Union. But what they did find in Marx is they found a critique of class structures and they found a critique of capitalism. What they found in Marx is they found this idea that the rich have always been oppressing the poor. And that at the root of all of this, the root of problems between workers 
and bosses or workers and owners of factories or workers and owners of corporations is the problem of capitalism. And as they talked about and saw in Marx, the, this ongoing struggle, this class struggle between rich and poor, what they realized is something similar is going on in the Gospels between Jesus, who represents and stands on the side of the poor, and the Roman Empire, the Roman government, and those who were high up in the Jewish religious establishment. And just like Marxism would say, the balance of power between the rich and the poor must be changed, or the balance of power between workers and owners must be changed. They thought they found the same thing in the Gospels, in the stories about Jesus and in the teachings of Jesus. Now again, what, what worried people is a lot of Christians, and this is still true in the United States, will say the way that Christians from the global south, Hispanic Christians, are understanding and defining Jesus. It's not biblical, it's actually Marxist. Now, many Christians from the global south would say, no, Marx just helped us to understand who Jesus really was. And it just turns out that Jesus, like Marx, wants to change the unjust structures of society. So this makes... Christology, when you talk about it from Latin America and from the global south, it makes it controversial because it's confrontation. It's supposed to make, or Jesus is supposed to make, people uncomfortable, especially the powerful and the rich. And this isn't just individuals that are supposed to be uncomfortable, it's countries, it's corporations, it's societies, it's governments, etc. The goal of liberation Christology is to recognize that the kingdom of God is here right now. And if you were going to put liberation Christology into the framework of high Christology, low Christology, what you would do is you would certainly put it in the frame of work of low Christology. It is focusing on the Jesus that's on earth. It is focusing on Jesus from the bottom up. And instead of thinking of the kingdom of God in Jesus' teachings as something that's future, of something that is to come, the Jesus of liberation theology is saying that kingdom is already here. And that kingdom means that oppression, injustice, etc. can be stopped and it can be fought by Christians who are following Jesus in the here and the now. So, yes, Jesus still talks about the kingdom of God, like he does for in all of the Gospels, and he does throughout all of the classic discussions of Christology. But the emphasis is very, very different here. The emphasis is on a kingdom that is now, not a kingdom that comes in the future. And because that kingdom is already here, the idea is that Jesus wants his followers to change society, to change the unjust situations and unjust structures that exist. So there are steps that have been thought through and given for how one should do this. Looking at the life of Jesus, Christians from the global south have said what we should do in order to imitate Jesus and to see Jesus as a liberator is, is we should go and liberate people as well. And the first thing we should do is we should recognize what oppression is. We should name oppressive situations. And we should call that oppression or an oppressive situation, an oppressive person, an oppressive government, an oppressive society, we should call it what it is. We should call it a sin. Deeper than that, 
we should look at the root causes of that oppression. So you would have a lot of Hispanics, Latinos, Latinos from the global south, from Latin America saying, the reason there is so much poverty in the world today is because the system is unjust. The system of capitalism is unjust. Wealth is not distributed fairly. And that isn't just a personal sin, it is a societal sin. Why is there warfare in the world today? It's not just a personal sin, it's because there are root causes to that. There are powerful governments and powerful societies that want to rule the world. And that's what causes violence, needless violence, in the world today. So the first thing you do is you name the sin. You recognize the oppressive situation and you call it out. And then you look for what is it behind that which is causing it. And then you move to step two, which is where you do look back in Christian tradition to see what might have caused this sin. You don't throw Christian tradition out, but you use tradition to see, has this situation been dealt with before in one way, shape, or form? If it has, what can you learn from that? Is it, if it hasn't, why hasn't it been dealt with? This leads to asking some hard questions. It means looking at the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus to ask, who's complicit? Are we complicit? Is the United States complicit? Is the church even complicit? And these are hard things that people often don't want to hear. Does church tradition and does the teachings of Jesus, does it say that we, who might think we're doing the right thing, are actually doing the wrong thing. The third step is to be guided by the experience of the oppressed. If anything, what the Jesus of liberation Christology is all about is a Jesus who dwells with the oppressed. So those people I mentioned at the beginning, Gutierrez, Sorbino, Baff, etc., they would say, if you want to know where Jesus is, go to those who suffer, go to those who are oppressed, who are oppressed. And what you should do is use Christian tradition to come up with new answers, new practices, new models or paradigms to help those who are oppressed. And it is completely possible that the oppressed are being oppressed because the church hasn't done its job. So all of this leads to an image of Jesus as Jesus the liberator. And for many Christians living in the global south, this is also true of Christians living in Africa, not just in Latin America. This is one of the major ways that Jesus is understood, one of the major ways that Jesus is seen. Instead of answering the question who, of who is Jesus by saying he is the son of God, he is the second person of the Trinity, what you will get is this title, Jesus is the Liberator. And again, that does not mean just liberation from personal sin. It means liberation from sinful structures. If a person accepts that Jesus is the liberator, and if that's really who the historical Jesus was, then this leads to all kinds of questions that have been asked by Christians who are not part of what's often called the first world, Western Europe, the United States, and Canada. I think some of this is slowly changing because we're starting to see that uh, 
there is a lot of disparity between the haves and the have-nots in this country. But when you live in Latin America or you live in Africa where there's always been disparity between the rich and the poor, Jesus as the liberator prompts a number of questions. One of those questions that's often asked when you talk about liberation Christology is, does Jesus want millions of people living in poverty? The answer is going to be no. But the question also includes, then why are so many people living in poverty? And why is it that there are many Christians in the United States in Western Europe, in Canada, that think this is okay and don't do anything about it. Another question is, does God, God want people to be malnourished, to be without land, to be colonized, to die in a war? And the answer is no, Jesus wants none of that. But why does it continue? A modern question that's asked by liberation theologians today, the second and third generation of liberation theologians, is does Jesus think it's right for 1% of the people to have the majority of the wealth in the world? And the answer is no. But again, the question is, why is it still like that? And so instead of asking, is Jesus God? Is he human? How does the Trinity work? These are the kinds of questions that liberation Christology or Jesus as the liberator is supposed to, ca supposed to cause Christians to ask, to think about, and ponder. And then you're supposed to say, okay, now that I know that, what do I do about it? This specifically leads to questions about suffering. Obviously, God does not want people to suffer. And sometimes people abuse the idea of suffering to simply control people in the church or to control people in society. What liberation Christology says is that even though God doesn't want people to suffer, if you want to find God, then you go to where people are suffering. If you want to understand where God is, then you go to those people who are on the margins of society. This is, as I mentioned earlier, this is very different from how Christianity worked throughout most of the centuries of its existence. What typically happens is if you are a follower of Jesus, the emphasis isn't placed on suffering. The emphasis is placed on prosperity. But in the global south, because that's a situation where people live and lived and still do live under great oppression and in great poverty, what they see in Jesus is a Jesus who suffers and wants to be with the suffering. No one should have to deal with that. No one should have to live with suffering. No one should have to be a part of that. But at the same time, they say, God is not on the side of the prosperous or on the side of the rich, but on the side of the poor and on the side of those who suffer. This type of Christology is also political. There has been a, a large movement, particularly in the United States, to say, that Jesus is a non-political or apolitical figure. You hear this a lot where people will say, Jesus is someone who is simply spiritual, who is teaching us about spirituality and values. He's not into politics. Liberation Christology says the exact opposite of that, that you cannot separate spirituality from politics. That everything Jesus says, that everything all of the New Testament writers say, is just as spiritual and theological and religious as it is political. So when Jesus talks about the coming of the kingdom of God, that's political. When Jesus talks about caring for the poor or loving your neighbor as yourself, that's political. 
perhaps something that we often don't think about in the United States, but is certainly thought of by Christians who live under various forms of oppression, is are we really obligated because of Jesus to obey powers that are above us? Throughout the history of Christianity, there's a text that people often go to. It comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13. And verse 1 of that chapter is a verse in which Paul writes, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And the text goes on and it says the governing authorities have been put there or placed there by God. Liberation Christology says it's okay to obey as long as the authority you are obeying is just and righteous. If that authority is causing oppression, you do not have to obey it. In certain cases, this means that like Jesus, you can become outraged and cleanse the temple. It means you can become angry and protest. It means you can fight back. There's different beliefs on this, some in liberation theology have thought it's okay to take up arms against their oppressors. Most in liberation theology have said, no, it's not. You fight back through nonviolence. But there's a limit in liberation Christology to how much you really have to obey. Now, this is very problematic when you're talking about a church structure that's hierarchical like the Roman Catholic Church with a pope, with bishops, priests, etc. Because even though Catholic priests came up with liberation Christology, they were also willing to say, if the church, if the ecclesiastical structure, if the pope is unjust, then you don't have to obey. Ultimately, what liberation Christology is saying is that final authority is to God and to God's kingdom, not to a government, not to a society, not to a kind of nationalism or patriotism, and not to a church. Another piece, too, liberation Christology, is that those individuals in Latin America that reread Jesus from modern times noticed that Jesus is not on the side of the middle class and he's not on the side of the rich. In fact, there is no middle class in ancient Israel or ancient Palestine or in the Roman Empire in the first century. You basically have the rich, which is one or two percent of society, and then everybody else. Liberation Christology focuses very seriously and literally on those parts of Jesus' teachings in which he tells a rich young ruler to give up everything he has and sell his possessions to the poor. It also focuses on Jesus blessing the poor. It focuses on the fact that Jesus himself was a carpenter who was part of the artisan class, which means he too was poor. Another way of looking at this kind of Christology is not just to call it liberation Christology, but to call it a Christology for the poor. And this goes along with the ideas of suffering and oppression, those two themes. What liberation Christology is saying then is that Jesus, as a liberator, is on the side of the poor because the poor are the most oppressed in society. So you don't find, again, Jesus among the rich. You don't find Jesus among the prosperous. You find Jesus among the suffering, the oppressed, and especially the poor. This led to a statement that was eventually adopted by the Roman Catholic Church, even though they were leery of what liberation theology was doing in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and even down to this day. And that statement is the preferential option for the poor. 
Liberation Christology says that Jesus, if you look at his life, if you look at his teachings, sides always with the poor. Therefore, he has a preferential option for the poor over the rich. This is not a message that has gone over well in very well-developed first world countries that are superpowers or have um, all kinds of money at their disposal. Now, as a country like the United States is starting to fragment between rich and poor and the middle class is disappearing, there are many individuals in this country saying, this actually makes sense. But saying Jesus has a preferential option for the poor is very alarming, especially for Christians that have power and Christians who have money. And liberation Christology is a challenge to those Christians because it's saying that's not the side that Jesus is on. And if you're on that side, then you need to reflect and think about your place in society and place in the world. And are you helping or are you harming? Now, liberation theologians don't just make this stuff up. I can't go through all of the texts that they use in the New Testament to to come to these conclusions. But they look at very specific passages in the Bible, in characters in the Bible, in the life and teachings of Jesus, and say that if you really study these, it's very clear that Jesus is on the side of the poor and the oppressed. And one of the texts that liberation theologians, creating liberation Christology, often go to is a sermon that Jesus gives in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. And in this sermon, Jesus goes back to his hometown. He goes to a synagogue, as a Jew would do on the Sabbath. He stands up and he reads this text from the Old Testament prophet, the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, which says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, release to the captives, to set those who are oppressed free, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is, at least according to the Gospel of Luke, this is the first public sermon Jesus gives, and gives it in his hometown in a synagogue. And after he reads this text from the prophet Isaiah, he sits down and he says, Today this text has been fulfilled. And people are alarmed when they hear this. People like Gutierrez, Boff, Sorbino look to this text and say, if this is Jesus' first sermon, we need to take this seriously. If the first thing he says is he quotes Isaiah, who says, good news is coming to the poor, release is coming to captives, the oppressed are going to be set free. then that's what Christianity should be about. Because that's what Jesus was about. In fact, people often don't catch this, but this acceptable year of the Lord. This is a statement about a festival in Jewish tradition known as the Jubilee. When the Jubilee festival occurred, and it, there's questions about whether it was ever practiced, what it actually meant is every time there was a jubilee called in ancient Israel, all debts, D-E-B-T-S, were forgiven. And we're not talking about sinful debts. We're talking about economic debts. So when Jesus stands up and says, I'm going to preach good news to the poor. I'm going to preach release to the captives. I'm going to set free the oppressed. And now it's the acceptable year of the Lord. And he says, all of this is being fulfilled today. To liberation theologians, this is a Christology. This is a Jesus who is saying, the poor are blessed, the captives go free, debts are forgiven, and those people who are being oppressed get set free from their oppression. Now what's happened over time is everything Jesus says here is often spiritualized. But liberation theologians say you cannot spiritualize these terms and these ideas. 
Jesus isn't talking about spiritual poverty or spiritual oppression. He's talking about real poverty and real oppression. And if he wants to free people from that, then that's what we should also be doing as followers of Jesus. Mary. Now remember, liberation theology and liberation Christology is, starts with Catholic priests. So of course Mary is going to be a part of this. Instead of talking about Mary just as the one who brought forth God, if you remember that discussion, when we talked about classical Christology, and instead of just being queen of heaven, as she's often called in Catholic thinking, liberation Christology looks at Mary and says, Mary is very, very important, not as the mother of God, but as the queen of the poor. And you might be wondering, well, where in the world are Latin American theologians getting this from? Here they look to Luke chapter 2, verses 46 through 45, to the Song of Mary. This is a song that she sings, or lyrics, or a hymn, or poetry that she speaks when she hears that she is with child, that she is going to give birth to the Messiah, to the Son of God. This is called in Latin the Magnificat, but it's usually called in English the Song of Mary. And there's a couple of lines in the Song of Mary that are important in liberation theology and important to liberation Christology. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and ex has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and he has sent the rich away empty. Again, this is a text where Gutierrez, Sorbino, Boff would say, you don't spiritualize this. You take it literally. If you're sitting around in the ancient world in the first century in Israel, and you say the mighty will be put down from their thrones, and the lowly will be exalted, the people sitting on thrones are either the religious leaders or the emperors of Rome. To say that he has filled the hungry with good things isn't spiritual hunger. It's real hunger. The rich are sent away empty is talking literally about the rich. And so liberation theologians say even Jesus' mom understood that this is what her son was going to do before he was even born. And this all goes back to that idea that there is a preferential option for the poor, not for the rich. The death of Jesus is also seen as a liberating event. In fact, it might be the liberating event. That cry of Jesus from the cross in Mark's gospel is taken very, very seriously. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cross and the suffering of Jesus aren't just seen as events that personally save you if you believe in them. But this is an event in which a falsely accused victim was unjustly condemned to death. Jesus becomes the model, the paradigm, of an individual who is right and who is innocent, but is condemned by an unjust society to death. What is being said here is that suffering isn't God's will for anyone, but when it happens, God identifies with the suffering of the unjust. The cross is meant then to show people that suffer injustice, that Jesus is on their side. The cross is meant to say suffering is a normal part of life. God does not like it, but when it happens, that's where God is. And again, liberation theologians are saying classical Christology forgot all of this that it's missing from something like the Nicene Creed, from all of these debates about the Trinity, etc. 
The ultimate form of justice is the resurrection. It too is about justice because what it tells people is that death isn't the end. However someone understands the resurrection, whether it's spiritual, whether it's bodily, whether it's something else, the resurrection of Jesus is an event that says when, an un, when something unjust happens to an innocent victim, it's not over. The poor, in other words, those who are unjustly condemned get to have their final say at the final judgment. Now, if we had time, and we don't in a, in a short survey class like this, but I would point out that this type of thinking about Jesus from Latin America influenced something called black Christology in the United States, which was very influential to someone like Martin Luther King. It also has been very influential in the most recent incarnation of liberation theology in the United States, and that is Black Lives Matter. It's also been very influential in political movements like Occupy Wall Street. Sometimes you will hear that Latin American liberation theology and the Jesus, the liberator idea is gone, it's done with, it's over. Uh, but it actually is still continuing and it's growing. And again, as I said, if you were to, to go and look at the history of political movements like Occupy Wall Street or movements like Black Lives Matter, you would find versions of liberation theology guiding those movements. When you hear things in liberation theology like Jesus is on the side of the 99% instead of the 1%, that's a statement that Occupy Wall Street borrowed. When you hear that Jesus is on the side of the poor or the oppressed, that's a fundamental tenet of Black Lives Matter. So you don't want to think of liberation Christology as something that's dead or something that's over with. It is a modern form of Christology that is still impacting the world. And believe it or not, um, the current Pope, Pope Francis, who comes from Argentina, uh, he is someone who is very familiar with this type of thinking. He's also someone who is sympathetic to it. Previous popes have not been, but previous popes have also been European. Uh, this is the first time in a long time that the Catholic Church has had a pope from Latin America. But why all of this has occurred is if you look at the history of modern Christianity, most Christians in the modern world are not in Europe anymore. They're not in the United States. They're certainly not in Canada. Christianity has shifted from the Western Hemisphere in the North, from Western Europe, the United States, Canada, to places like Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And the experience of those Christians has not been one of prosperity. It's not been one of safety. It's not been one of peace. It's been one of oppression. So you have here a rereading, a rethinking of Jesus and a rethinking of Christology. It certainly is low Christology. It's certainly fun uh, focusing on the humanity of Jesus. But it is a much different and much more modern way of thinking about Christology and thinking about Jesus.